This is my family, mental illness, and me. I'm Dr. Pamela Jenkins. I, like so many people, grew up with a parent with a mental illness. My mum, Irene, had schizoaffective disorder. This had a profound effect on my childhood and continues to impact my life, even today. This podcast is made by the charity, Our Time. In each episode, a different guest will share their own experience of growing up with a family member or family members living with mental illness. I really hope that you enjoy listening to these conversations as much as I enjoyed having them. We do explore some difficult and potentially triggering memories throughout the series. So there's advice and links to support in the show notes. Please, please do speak to someone if you're affected by anything raised in the episodes. On this episode, I'm speaking with stand-up comedian and host of the Bad Boys Done Good podcast, Tom Ward. Hello, my name is Tom Ward and I am a stand-up comedian. Hi, Tom. Lovely to meet you. Hello, Pam. Thank you so much for coming and joining me today. It's very exciting to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. You've got a good fringe. Oh, thanks very much. People used to call it the mushroom, but likewise, uh, can't part with it. Once you've got a fringe, there's no going back. I know, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lifestyle. It is. It definitely is. So, Tom, tell me who we're here to talk about today and why you're on My Family Mental Illness and Me. I would say uh, the best person to talk about is my dad. Yeah. Because um, he was clearly someone uh, who had mental health issues at a time when it wasn't really talked mm-hmm. about in his generation. And it kind of affected the whole family dynamic growing up. Um, so, yeah, it'd be my dad. So, when did you first become aware that your dad had a mental illness or was struggling with his mental health? I would say when I was 12 was the first time I had to start understanding what a breakdown was because my dad had a breakdown when I was 12 and that sort of entailed him being at home suddenly and in bed and crying and I'd be like okay well I love my dad this is I'd seen my dad cry before but it was different this time and so someone people were using this term breakdown and yeah I just was like well okay this is different this is different um but yeah that was that was the first time I think I realized something was up with my dad properly though he was never diagnosed or there was never any medical um fallout from it or medication or anything like that he was basically increasingly religious so he converted to Christianity uh, when he was 36 and then gradually throughout the 80s when I was a kid he started getting more and more um, fundamentalist more fervent um, more in sort of involved in the church and in outreach and evangelism and he was very um, almost like superstitious about being letter of the law with the bible so he kind of that affected him that almost made him like overwhelmed with you know having to try and keep up this impossible standard of conduct and even going down to his thought processes being having to be monitored and kept in check and i just think it started to take its toll mm. on him um especially as he was trying to run a business um in a christian way not easy to do um he was an accountant. He had to give 10% of his money to the church, which which made it hard, especially around a time of a, of a recession. Yeah. He had staff, you know, he found out one of them was stealing from one of the, um, from several of the clients. There was all sorts going on, building up to it. But looking back, he was just a man who was always on close to the edge for various reasons. But the religion made him um, very rigid and he was completely obsessed with saving people from what he considered you know eternal damnation and all this sort of stuff so he was yeah he was always kind of close to the bone close to the edge yeah um looking back but yeah it's tricky it's tricky calling it a mental illness isn't it because some people would just say that's you know profound belief but you know the overall yeah. effect was not a happy one yeah did the religion play much of a part in his breakdown so 
you know, did that sort of go hand in hand? Because sometimes with mental illness, religion is a feature, but it presents in different ways depending on the religion. So my mum was heavily believed she was hearing God. Um, you know, she was hearing voices. But would you say the religion featured in the breakdown? I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're all tangled up because mm. I think without the religion, there may have been less of the guilt around money because, you know, there's a lot of anti-materialism in Christianity. Um, so he had this conflict at the heart of it that he needed to make enough money to run his business, to, mm -hmm. you know, to look after his family, pay his mortgage. But at the same time, he was extremely guilty of, around money, didn't want material wealth felt that it was a sin. So I feel like, yeah, I feel like the religion was very in, in, involved in it because the doctrines were weighing on him. Mm -hmm. um, and he, I think he felt the weight of the world, you know, in, in terms of like having to save people. It really affected him. He, he felt that he had to save his own parents, his family, my mum's family. Um, you know, that caused a massive rift um, in the family. So his attitudes um in the end there was a huge period of time when when my family and my mum's sisters and brothers and all that lot didn't speak for years because there was a fallout based on my dad pushing too hard being socially inappropriate with with the you know talking about it and mm -hmm. also because he was broke so he needed my mum to release some money from the family house that they were all going to inherit one day so that oh, caused gosh. a big old thing, you know. He had he was in debt, so he needed my mum to get some cash. Yeah. So yeah, I would say religion was at the absolute heart of it. Do you think your family recognised that he was mentally unwell, or were they just angry about it? Well, my mum was a Christian too, so he converted her from kind of traditional Catholicism to born again Christianity in the early nineties. My sister was in, my, I was in, you know, I was too young to really know. My brother was a baby, but we wouldn't have seen it like that at the time. Um, as you kind of with retrospect. Mm -hmm. um, and meeting Christians and religious people that aren't like that, you kind of go, oh, okay, it's not inevitable. You don't have to become neurotic and miserable and anxious and obsessed. You can, ideally, you want to see someone who's quite joyful. That's really the idea. Yeah. Um, but at the time, no, we didn't see it as a mental illness. Yeah. Uh, though I know, it's, maybe it, people it, outside did. It's difficult, isn't it? Because it's not saying that, you know, being very heavily religious and having a really strong faith makes you mentally unwell. Far from it. Many people are religious, but often people who are mentally unwell, I guess, maybe find some sort of comfort or connection with extreme forms of religion that then... Um, result in the, the kind of situation that that your dad has found himself in i think it taps into whoever you are so whoever you are already mm -hmm. is is the kind of mold and then the the religion or whatever belief gets poured into the mold and you just it kind of just exacerbates the key character traits that you already have so mm -hmm. i think he was already quite a letter of the law obsessive mm -hmm. um prone to anxiety and despair so i think the religion it may have reassured him fundamentally about yeah. the afterlife and some sort of peace um but i think it also exacerbated what was already there yeah and what do you remember about that breakdown then that first time when you were 12 what do you remember? I remember I remember him crying in bed and going into his room and feeling the the reversal of roles and feeling that I was needing to parent him in that moment and hold his hand and he was sobbing and um he was also laughing at points which is really unnerving to deal with and he was laughing because he was grateful because he'd woken up singing a, a, a hymn and he saw it as a sign that God was with him that you know that he would the angels were with him the song itself he was very excited by the lyrics they, they he felt that they represented where he was now and that he felt blessed and I remember feeling 
a little bit perplexed. Um, I might be sort of misremembering this, but I think I was perplexed because I was thinking, well, look at the state of you and <laughs> you're grateful and you're thanking God, you know, it's like, how much, <laughs> how, I mean, does God always get thanked? Is that the deal? You can't really lose here, can he? You've fallen apart and you're yeah. thanking God. It's like, God must be loving it. He wins no matter what, you know. It just didn't feel like, it didn't feel like good news to me, but he, he was looking for something to feel joyful about and I think he found it in that moment. And were there any medical interventions at that? Like you said, he never had a diagnosis. So when he had his breakdown, did you deal with it yourselves as a family or? It just kind of, he was at home for a couple of weeks. He went walking around the block, you know, did no work. He was quite fragile. And then just gradually started going back to work. There was no therapy that I was aware of. Definitely no medication. Um, because of his religion, he wouldn't take as he called it counsel from a woman so you know there were women therapists but he wouldn't speak to them um i think he got you know prayers with his mates you know he'd meet up with his christian mates and they'd have prayers maybe maybe double prayer time you know and i think there was an awareness that my dad wasn't well and there'd be people mm -hmm. who sending him well wishes but no it was kind of back to back to it and then after that his faith kind of went up a notch and um, he became even more um, fervent about it all. So what happened then? Did he have any further breakdowns when you were a teenager? Um, no, but he he just became more um, strict and he saw that I was wobbling. He saw that my faith was wobbling. So he, tam he, ta he sort of amped it all up a little bit or quite a lot. So he started really laying on the the afterlife stuff and mm -hmm. the threats of what would happen if I didn't stick with it or come back to it. Cause I'd had a, a uh, I was basically off the, off the rails by that point, 11, 12 and not really wanting to go to church, resisting it every week. I started swearing for the first time and I was loving it. Swearing <laughs> was just like, Oh God, this feels so good after <laughs> never swearing my whole life. <laughs> when you were 11, 12 before you said yeah. a swear word. Love yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. I, I swore, I swore once when I was eight and then I burst into tears because of the guilt. Oh. I just sat on a bench in the playground and the dinner lady came over and everyone had gone and I was like, what's wrong? I was like, I just swore. She's like, that's all right. I was like, no, it's not. Trust me, it's not good. It's not right. It's a sin. She was just like, all right, this is this is more than I'm paid to deal with. Um, <laughs> Were you so, at a yeah. religious school? No, was no, no, like, just a regular no. school, regular, regular school. school. Interestingly, he didn't send us to any military Christian schools. We were kind of Church of England, you know, very loose. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, swearing was magnificent. I just felt... <laughs> ecstatic and I could be a bit <laughs> harsh I'd be playing football in the playground with my mates or the kids in my class and I'd be a bit more like harsh with them and I, the, I just felt great I was yeah. like okay life's a lot easier when you can say what you really think rather than having to squash it all down and pretend you're really kind <laughs> <laughs> so I had a couple of months of feeling absolutely thrilled by the new potential and then my dad mm -hmm. sort of would hammer me quite quite a lot with stuff about hell and it, it did work i um oh. yeah i had some big old panic attacks usually at bedtime and then uh, that kind of whipped me back into shape oh gosh um, for a year or so but then eventually 13 14 i was just like do you know what i can't do this anymore it's just not there uh, the fear was there but i just didn't have the belief so mm -hmm. there's only so much you can do um when you're only doing it out of fear. Do yeah. you know what I mean? It just didn't feel like a real thing. It's so interesting because it's so hard to imagine. And well, I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, when you're panicking and you've got that fear, is it coming from, you know, your fear associated with the religion? And, or is it coming from, your anxiety about your your father's mental health because the two are sort of and you can't separate them the way you're talking about it it's really difficult to separate the two and um, so i just i can't imagine what must have been going on in your head 
I didn't factor in my dad in it at all. It, to be honest, he was the guy. He was telling me what to do. He was laying down the truth with a capital T. There was no, there was no part of me going. This guy's a bit ill. I think this guy needs help. There was none of that, and this was pre mental health. Mental health wasn't really talked about until the twenty tens. Yeah. You know, it wasn't really a thing. Occasionally, someone would mention it, but it wasn't the way it is now, where mm. everyone's on the lookout for signs that someone's not well, or people have a diagnosis now. You know. Mm -hmm. medication is discussed people there's not a big stigma but yeah when i was 12 13 I, I wasn't thinking my dad is ill so there's no part of you that wondered if he was mentally maybe not the same as other people or that the religious the extent of his religious beliefs might be unusual i mean i i i clocked that he was different to other dads you know he was he was odd in that way he was quite a charming guy you know without the religion you could see that he was a big hearted softy um he wasn't he wasn't a tragic person he was he was a he was a nice guy but he just had this top layer of beliefs but uh, yeah i saw that he was different to the other dads i'd notice it the other dads a lot of the time would seem more relaxed um a bit more cool you know a bit more laid back they'd swear and be a bit sarcastic whereas my dad wouldn't um i was aware that because he told me that you know we had to save everyone you kind of can't help but look around and go see the world through those eyes you know the yeah. lost the lost and the saved it was as simple as that so i knew that my dad was extreme but i also felt that he had to be because the stakes were so high yeah did you feel like he had a focus on, when you say about saving people, did he talk about how he felt he needed to save you at all? Yeah, and that was what, that's what hell was about for him, you know. So if I was scared, he'd say, good, fear is the first sign of wisdom. Um, so if I was panicking or sad or afraid or feeling got at at school by the other kids, he'd say, good, this is all good. This is a sign that you're doing it correctly. You know, to fear God is wisdom. To be persecuted by people is a sign of, um, is a sign that you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And when did you realise that perhaps alongside the, you know, the the relig the strong religious beliefs that your father had, that there might be. I know he had his breakdown, but at what point did you realise that actually there might be a, a mental instability going on or mental illness? I think gradually, as I moved out of my teens into my 20s, I could see that he was just essentially lost in a lot of ways. You know, all through my childhood, he'd, he'd kind of shared far too much information with me and my sister about his life, his thoughts, his fears. We were fully aware of his financial fears from a very young age. We were fully aware of his interest in other women, his guilt around the cheating he'd done before my mum, or before he found Christianity. He'd tell us this stuff and it'd be like, whoa. And then, you know, later on, you kind of, 2021, 20, you're like, okay, this guy, he's asking me for advice. He's listening very intently when I say, Dad, you know what you need to do? He'd just listen. He, he was looking for answers. And I think I would become more aware that he was, he was quite troubled and lost in my sort of early 20s. And then when he got, he got a brain tumour, um, it felt like to all of us, it felt like almost inevitable that that would be the thing that took him because it was attacking the part of his brain, the part of his body that was the most vulnerable, the most exhausted. Um, and I think that really cemented it for us. It felt like a, it felt like a death that had been caused by unhappiness. And obviously there's no way of proving that. It's like when you say someone dies of a broken heart, it's, it's very hard to prove, but it kind of, it felt, um, likely so i wanted to ask about your sister and did you did you ever talk about it with her yeah oh yeah 
So she left the church before me because she's four years older than me. So she left the church around 15. So when I was 11, 12 and started to wobble, she was there. And then so when I fully left, we chatted a lot. And she was kind of a crucial person in helping me leave and helping me navigate it. And also she was there when I was having panic attacks. I could sit in her room. And she'd play some music and I'd say, turn it off, turn it off, it's scary. You know, she'd play something and I'd be like, that's too scary, you know, or whatever. And she was a, she was an absolute crucial ally in it. But you never spoke at all about the possibility that something else might be going on with your dad? Not until later, not until later, not until my late teens and her early 20s, did we start talking about mental illness? And what were your thoughts on it? What, um, what, what did you think was going on? I mean, bipolar um, or depression, um, clear anxiety. And depression and anxiety usually go hand in hand. Um, mm-hmm. I've found anyway. I mean, I think, I think it's well known. Um, yeah, depression and anxiety were, were, I mean, clear. Yeah. And have you yourself ever, I know you said you had panic attacks. Well, I get, I get panicked, but I, what I do is I just, I've learned to remain very still and to breathe and to remember that it passes and to remember that it's a kind of, it just needs calm. So I'm better at, not allowing it to escalate to the point where I'm screaming and running around, which is where I was when I was a kid. Um, but yeah, the uh, the overall effect of all of that and coming out of it and feeling completely stranded because it kind of suspends your development growing up in religion, in, in extreme religion. It, it, it kind of disrupts your development. So I didn't really have any social skills I didn't really know how to make friends properly. I'd have one or two friends here and there, but I didn't really know how to make friends. I was very annoying. I was um, didn't understand the rules. You know, I'd just make faux pas and um, I had to learn it all. And it took a long time. I'm not saying I'm a master friend maker now, but it just takes a long time to learn. And you have to sort of learn who you are again, because it all gets interrupted by a set of rules that are placed on top and so you have to kind of work out what your real interests are and what you feel best where you feel best um and like all teenagers you have to go through some bad friends and some bad relationships and all through my 20s was a lot of that and 30s but I, yeah the depression really started hitting when i was 13 i remember crying constantly and that would have definitely been a fallout from the church of just feeling lost just bereft from it all and just feeling like traumatized not really having the words for it so i was showing all the signs of trauma crying constantly nervous afraid um withdrawn um yeah and it led to a lot of issues it led to a lot of issues that have taken a long time to to get control of and to find equilibrium that's that's been a that's been a life's work 25 years of of work really to try and get to a point where i have self-sufficiency and can cope and don't get overwhelmed and you know all that sort of stuff and feel don't feel panicked going into social situations and that kind of thing so it's interesting i wanted to pick up on the word you use the word trauma i was actually going to ask you if you would consider the experiences that you had as a child as being traumatic or a trauma. So when you think back about it and that trauma, how much of it do you associate specifically with what happened with the way you were brought up in that religious environment? And how much of it do you associate with the mental health of your dad? Again, I think the two are intertwined. I think the religion and my dad came hand in hand and they were they were, it's hard to separate them. Um, I think the trauma, as I, yeah, I would definitely call it trauma now. I didn't, I didn't really understand that. People would talk about it in my early 20s. I remember one of my dad's old friends 
you know, he'd become estranged with, you know, they didn't really have any contact anymore, but she was very much like, yeah, you're, you're traumatized. And I was like, what are you on about trauma? That's, that's not, that's uh, not the right word for this. That's for soldiers, you know, people who've been through horrific physical things. Didn't feel like I, I, I earned that word, you know, but yeah, gradually I would, I started realizing that's what it was and that, that reading about it and realizing that I was showing the mm. signs of it. Um, I would say a lot of it's down to the to the religious stuff and the effects it had on my nervous system when I was in a constant state of fear and dread, um, feeling like I had to save everyone's soul, worrying about my own soul. Um, that's a lot to have on your on your shoulders, no matter what age you are. But when you're a child, you, you know it's extra. Yeah. Um, and then I think. Um, I think as a teenager, you sort of, and then going into life and not really, and having so much anxiety, so much stress and not really having the skills or the tools or the practice to know how to handle anything. I felt so out of my depth. And all I had really was just being a, a mm -hmm. joker. And I learned quite young that I was just like, I could mess around, be silly and that people would find it funny and want to be my friend, but I didn't really know how to be friends. So I kind of, I was kind of like, always entertaining the room but never really feeling close to the people I wasn't able to have one-on-ones and you know I did have a couple of friends but it was just so hard so yeah the religion yeah. set the tone and then emerging from that it's like you know reintegrating yourself into society isn't it um so I would say yeah the trauma was largely that and then all the experiences that come with not knowing how to navigate life very well that's also very traumatic and leads to a lot of humiliating situations. Um, and it wouldn't take much to make me feel humiliated as well. Just the sensitivity oh. was so high. If I went to a party and someone looked at me funny or I felt a little bit uncomfortable, I'd just fucking fall apart. Just leave the party and, you know, it took a long time to, yeah, you know, not, not be yeah. like that. It's just completely understandable. And it's so interesting to hear you say that, that when you said before that you just, you struggled to make friends and that you weren't very social. And then now doing what you do, and it, it's just amazing. Yeah. Like how did you, because you said, you know, you're, you were always the joker. <laughs> so how did it come about if you are, you know, to go from being anxious and, and feeling awkward socially and, nervous and whatnot to to standing on a stage uh, not all the tea in china could not is that are we allowed to say that i'm not sure you, can you say that tea there's tea there's tea in china all the tea in sainsbury's um all the wine in the world that's actually you're not allowed to say that either the, the world is, is a slur <laughs> could not get me to, it's too, too broad, broad. Uh, also not all the wine in the world is very tasty um all the wine in the world could not get me to stand up on a stage that's where the panic for me would really come in so when you say about pa having panic attacks and things and all of that anxiety I am in awe that you can channel that or park that and stand up in front of a room full of people like that's unbelievable how do you, what led you there how did you get there it's uh, well I think a lot of comedians are a bit broken and it's kind of like I mean, I think a lot of people are a little bit broken. Probably not allowed to say broken either, to be fair. I think there's a sort of general rule with comedians that they, a lot of them, come to comedy as a kind of, from a point of uh, bereftness. They feel outside, they feel like they're outsiders. They feel like the the illusion of life as we've been shown it has kind of cracked. There's some sort of, um, cynicism that allows them to go oh well you know let's do this and it's kind of like facing the wrong way in a in a room for a job it says a lot about how you are and how you fit in so yeah do you know yeah. what I mean so the fact that there's a crowd in front of you and you're facing the wrong way you're not in that crowd yeah. you're facing the crowd suggests that you don't really feel like the crowd so there's usually a a kind of outsider I thing going of it on like that but it is it is 
it is i know i mean i know there's a lot of musicians going on stages as well and you wouldn't necessarily all musicians feel like outsiders but there's a thing with comedy that's so confronting and so direct and it's bizarre because you see very shy people do it you see very nervous people overcome their mm-hmm. fear to do it because they they have this stuff they need to get off their chest but they also fundamentally feel um that they don't belong in that crowd and that they have stuff they've got to say and it does attract some people you would not expect to be able to do it you know you meet them off stage and they're really awkward and really shy and then they go on stage and then they're walking around and I'm actually not like that I'm in real life and on stage I'm fairly laid back and um and I'm not like a different person on and off stage. I mean, I'm very serious on this podcast, but I'm not normally <laughs> this serious. Uh, maybe you could add some <laughs> some jokes in the after recording. Be... Could do a little. I'm just I'm just giving very sincere <laughs> answers here, and I'm very aware that it's probably quite hard work. But um, but that's okay. Um, that's, that's yeah, it's a. Uh, I always wanted to. I wanted to be in a band. You know, I wanted to be a singer. So that was the first plan. And that was my that would that represented freedom. That represented redemption. Being in a band, being as big as U two. I wanted to be Bono. You know, I'd watch U two videos, and I'd watch Billy <laughs> Idol, and um, and and I'd I'd watch Talking Heads, and I'd watch Seal, and I was like, these are guys, these are these are rock stars, man. I want to be these guys. But it was always big crowds, and I was like, right, that is my way to freedom. That is my way to feel loved and loose and off grid and heard and then so i you know i was in in bands before so i was kind of used to that um i felt like i felt like i it felt right it felt right to be yeah. on a stage um so when that didn't work out it was a case of now what and yeah the i mean when a, when a gig goes bad it does bring up a lot of the horrible feelings um which I wouldn't say are specific to me and my experiences, but they do bring up, you know, if I get heckled aggressively by someone or an audience is indifferent to me, it's very painful, very painful in a way that feels like it's got roots. It's not just a new pain. It feels like, oh God, this re- this takes me back, yeah. you know, to feeling alone at school and rejected. Um and ashamed you know luckily it doesn't happen too often (laughs) i'm sure it doesn't (laughs) and what you said a minute ago there when you were when you first started out wanting to be in a band and pursuing music um that it would be a way to sort of to feel loved did you feel loved when you were younger did you feel loved as a child by your father, by your mother, who we've not spoken about yet? Um, I guess I did, yeah. But I mean, it, I, I, my dad was loving; he was tender. Um, but uh, the the essential ingredient within that was, I only love you really if you fulfil these um, obligations that I give you. And he even said that he loved God more than us. You know, he told us, and he said that he he the the underlying implication was always, "I will love you less if you're not a believer." So it was condition. It felt conditional. Um, it, it, when I left the church, I, I I felt that he was ultimately very disappointed by me and very worried about me, which is also a type of rejection. He was worried about me because I was going to hell. You know, your own dad thinks you're going to hell. It's quite hard to feel profoundly loved, you know, even though part of his fear would have come Mm -hmm. from love. So complicated. Do you still feel that now? So are you you religious now at all? No. No. I I think I already knew the answer to that (laughs) question, but I thought I didn't want to make any assumptions. I am a trained, I am a priest. Uh, yeah, now imagine that <laughs> after all this. Yes, come to my church. <laughs> Pam, we'd love to pray for you at the end of this podcast. <laughs> yes, I'm definitely going to hell. <laughs> and here's my leaflet. Um, 
it's interesting because, well, what I'd like to know is, even though you're not religious, do you still ever feel or have any uh, emotions or residual effects of those feelings when you were religious and the way the thought processes that you used to go through when you were younger. The reason I ask is because I, when I was much younger, was brought up Catholic. And even though I'm not religious now, I still find myself having thoughts that are, that definitely are hangovers from, from my childhood, from, from that experience. Uh, yeah, I think, I have um, catastrophization. Is that the word? Mm -hmm. I, I have a yeah. feeling yeah. that everything's about to go wrong. And I think that might come from the dread, you know, uh, the dread that was kind of I inherited from my dad. That hell is around the corner. Um, that the end of days is coming. Um, that your life can collapse. That you, you know, you can lose everything. I, I, I felt... That, that everything was very fragile uh, growing up. I, you know, we would move house. There was less and less money. There was, it, none of it felt strong. None of it felt solid. And there was also this undercurrent of catastrophe looming. So I think that c catastrophe is still in there. It's in my system. So I have a tendency to think that the worst is about to happen. And I have to really be careful with that and not believe it. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, when you have too many coffees and you suddenly feel like the whole world's about to attack you yes, <laughs> or whatever. It's like the, the world hasn't changed. It's just your system is all just booted up in the wrong direction. You're overstimulated. And I think, yeah, my, my brain does do that sometimes. Um, yeah. I worry that Having something, to rationalize. yeah, something awful is about to happen. And I'm like, maybe, but so far life's been pretty nice. You know, how many mm -hmm. opportunities I've had, um, how lucky I am to have come out of all of that stuff with some with some sanity and not to have turned nasty or vindictive or cruel, to not be a complete mess, to be able to do the, the job that I want to do, you know, to mm -hmm. live an incredibly, like, just a privileged life, you know. Um, most yeah. people don't get to do a job they adore and to live in a way they want to live and to have so much time and wake up at half past 10 if I want, you know, it's a privilege. I don't have to be on a rush yeah. hour train. I don't have to wear yeah. a tie. <laughs> I've got great friends. I've got an amazing sister and a brother. You know, I'm, I'm got a girlfriend. It's like, wow, it, it, I kind of take stock yeah. and go, there's no reason to feel like everything's, you know, that there's some horrible thing coming. But yeah, it's still, that still comes. That still comes. Yeah. And it's it's interesting as well. It's it's great. You said before that, you know, you're normally telling jokes and, you know, being the joker. And it, But on this podcast now, you're, you're talking more seriously. Mm. It's nice that you are able to talk about it without joking, I guess. Mm -hmm. I guess some people, you know, you don't seem to have a, a sort of a defensive mechanism there that, that is turning everything into a joke. It's really refreshing that you're talking so, um, just with such clarity about it and such um, purpose and frankness, you know, this is just how it was. And, and that's your experience and, you know, really owning it. It's, do you find that difficult? Are you do you feel compelled to be to be making light of it, or is that not something that you would ever really be able to do? Oh no, definitely, I've made light of it. Normally, I mean, in a lot of situations, I make light of it, but I, I don't know. It's like I don't really feel like it today for some reason, um, and I can be sincere. It doesn't bother me too much. I feel a little bit embarrassed that you've basically got a comedian on your podcast who's. <laughs> He's <laughs> basically just read out his diary extracts from 1992 <laughs> no. onwards. Um, no. But yeah, no, I'm all right with it. I'm all right with it. I don't mind it. I feel like, you know, we got straight in there with who are we going to talk about today? I was like, okay, you know, there's no, it's not yeah. a funny story to me, my dad. It's, yeah. it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't really, it doesn't really make me laugh. It's kind of, uh, yeah. it's kind of absurd, but, but also extremely, it's, it's twisted, you know, so I'm, I'm all right with it. 
And I, I mean, yeah. I generally speaking like to have a laugh as often as possible. And I don't understand yeah. people that don't. I just don't understand people that don't want to make everything into a joke or a, a repeat joke or want to constantly mention another thing that they've, you know what I mean? You have running jokes with yeah. your friends. I just love yeah. it. I have running jokes that have gone on for 25 years <laughs> based on something that Jim Carrey said in a movie or some something one of my customers said to me when they came into my charity shop. And I've got hundreds of these that I can just drop in a word and my brother gets it, my sister gets it, my girlfriend yeah. gets it. I just love all that. But yeah, today I'm, uh, I'm honoring the subject matter without turning it into a razzle dazzle show yeah <laughs> i guess it's hard to be a bit more light-hearted about it when it like when you say the subject matter is is what it is mm. and also not all of us are gifted with being a hoot you know <laughs> like i'm really jealous of that natural ability that you have i'm so envious to be able to just be really quick-witted occasionally whenever i'm quick-witted or see something funny it's never deliberate like I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not meant to be funny <laughs> So, so you've got a real gift that is just absolutely brilliant. So never, never feel like you have to dull that, you know, even, even on something like this. You don't seem like, you don't seem like someone that's not funny to me. You seem uh, like, a, I don't know. You're very, you seem like you've got a, a, a an eye on the joke. <laughs> I love the jokes. I do love to mess around and I do love a good joke. And the banter, as we say up yeah. here in Scotland. <laughs> It's so smart. It's such a, a an intelligence. It's a real specific intelligence that I think is just, yeah, a gift. That's nice. So, and where do you get that from? And is it is it from your dad, would you say, or your mum? You've not spoken yet about your mum. Where does she fall into this? Um, my mum is um, a, compli a complicated uh, person that would need a whole other podcast. <laughs> But yeah, I'm, I, there's not really that much to say about my mum in terms of it's an extremely complicated fallout from the church stuff. She's still a Christian. We have to navigate that and try not to talk about it because if she mentions it, I get annoyed. Um, you know, she doesn't bring up Jesus or praying or stuff like that. And I don't lecture her about her hacking cough. That's clearly because she's lactose intolerant. You know, yeah. I just we just don't go there. I'm like, Mum, give up the cheese. She's like, No, darling, it's nothing to do with that. And it's like, Mum, <laughs> you've got a cough, you've got a phlegmy cough, and you don't smoke. You've got to give up the cheese and the milk. No, darling, it's organic. It's nothing to do with the organic. Yeah. Um, so we have we have our rules to keep our relationship mm -hmm. functioning, and it works well. It works better than it's ever worked, which is good um, mm -hmm. for the contact we have. I don't know. I, I think uh, my dad was fun. He was funny. He was daft. Uh, my sister is very funny. And her sense of humor was, you know, obvious to me from a young age. She was, she loved joking around. She had, again, always looking for the joke with her mates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, she definitely influenced me. She showed me movies. She showed me Leslie Nielsen movies, Jim Carrey movies. <laughs> um, you know, I love that silly stuff. Um, she showed me shooting stars with Vic and Bob. These things have just kind of, you know, these are my, the things I watched, Chevy Chase films. Um, and yeah, she was definitely the first major influence, I would say. Um, it's that thing of coming from a dark place, you know, it's like, what are you going to yeah. do with it? Are you going to be morose or are you going to mess around? And, um, yeah, my sister yeah. was a big influence. And then my brother coming through, even as a kid, we started having great times you know i'd be 17 18 19 he'd be 10 11 12 and we'd listen to wham vinyls and dance around in front no. of the mirror and watch movies and take the piss out of pop stars on on music tv and just sit there and laugh and joke about what we were seeing and the you know the kind of posturing and ego of the musicians and their stupid videos that they were making and their you know, their attempts to do ballads when they were trashy. It's like, don't do it, but don't try and show us that you've got depths. You're just, you know, do you know what I mean? You're normally like yeah. gyrating against a, a pole <laughs> and now you're looking down the camera and trying to act like you're really sad. It's like, go away. So we just, even, you know, he was 10, 11. He was an ally. He was funny. He was ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. brother, sister, and dad. Dad was silly as well. Loved that, just terrible one-liners and bad puns and, 
pulling his trousers up too high and stuff like that, you know. You're lucky to have your siblings. Yeah, really That's lucky. That's a real, yeah, that is also a real gift. Yeah. Um, I, I'm an only child, but mm. I do have two cousins who I call my sisters because I went to live with them when I was 10. So they are, um, you know, they're my sisters as far mm. as I'm concerned. Mm. But growing up when I was younger, it would have been really nice to have had siblings to share with, to, to experience, to share the experience with. Yeah. And it's it's funny, way, way back in the conversation, you said something about, I'm not sure if I'm remembering this right. I guess that's, I can't remember exactly what it was you were talking about, but you said, I'm not sure if, if I'm remembering this right. Yeah, about my dad's breakdown. Um, and uh, that's wh right, whether yeah. I was yeah, baffled by his, his gratitude for the hymn that he was singing. Yeah, exactly. And it's a funny one um, with memory. I guess if you've got siblings, they can maybe hold you in check a bit more. But I've, I always think, am I remembering things correctly? And then when there are people around that maybe experienced it as well, they're there to contradict you or to sort of share in that memory. Absolutely. But sometimes I just feel like <laughs> I'm just, I have these memories, but I just, I'm not ever clear. You know, to me, they feel very real, but I guess, I don't know, maybe there are elements that are being misremembered. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have, do you guys share, do you share the memory of how it was? We do. Yeah, we do. And me and my sister can talk about it endlessly. You know, we still talk about it regularly. One of us will say something about dad, about mum, about church, about identity, um, you know, and we're just off. We just chat, walking along, going to the shops. You know, she'll be in Morrison's. I'll be walking home from the cafe and she'll be like, oh, yeah, something about mum. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, it's true. And then, you know, we'll be back in the thing. We, we're, we're, we're endlessly interested by it and yeah. talking about it and sharing. And yeah, it is invaluable. It is absolutely yeah. invaluable. Can I ask just quickly, your mum, mm. um, and I know, you know, you've intimated that it's sensitive and um, you don't all necessarily agree on how much to share. But I just wondered if your mum has ever or did ever acknowledge that, that your dad did or might have been mentally ill. Is that something that Good she question. has ever... I've not heard her say that, actually. I don't think she, I think she saw him as a warrior, as in not with the A, but an O, mm -hmm. somebody worried. Um, and someone who was very anxious and stressed. But I don't know if she'd go deeper than that. I think I would need to ask her, but I think she sees him as, as you know, fighting the good fight fundamentally yeah but that's a really good question it's a really good question um but i've never heard her say it i've never heard her say yes darling your father was bipolar you know or something <laughs> like that that is a very good impression yeah. of my mum by the way <laughs> um was, she, was he on any medication no your dad no no just no. you know just prayer maybe asked that before yeah. prayer and singing um gosh no he wasn't on medication that would that would be to admit that he needed help from the world rather than through God and Jesus, and I yeah. think he would never have done that. And that's probably why my mum hasn't called him a depressive, because that would be to admit that potentially some of it came from another thing, and couldn't be yeah. fixed by Jesus or God or prayer. Gosh, but you're all on good terms now, and ever you know, you said your mum and you found a a balance and a ground that you can, you know, relate on and yeah. have a relationship on. Yeah, we have contact. Um, I don't, I'm not angry with her constantly. Um, I just, I just think you've got one mum and yeah, it's too sad. The idea of not having contact with my mum. I just can't, can't, yeah. it just doesn't feel good to be in a state of anger and resentment. So I just, got to a point where I had it out again with her five years ago and um and now I'm just I can't I can't stay in the anger and resentment anymore so I just decide just to be very careful about the contact instead and enjoy it 
yeah. for what it is because when we're together we can have a great time and have a laugh yeah well i'd say that's the best the best way hold hang on to her mm. <laughs> is my advice yeah my mum always used to say never keep spite not that mm. i'm suggesting that you're spiteful but she always said that and i mm. just always think it whenever i you know i'm cross about something or you know yeah. what's the point in hanging on to it really you're only poisoning yourself <laughs> mm. so it's um it's useful for a, for a while i think rage anger resentment it yeah. tells you something and it, it usually tells you that you need to talk to them um yeah. ultimately uh, ideally because then you can clear it you can talk about it you can ask them the questions you can have it out you can find out what's reasonable about what you're feeling and what's not what's based on fact or misunderstanding but if it still lingers then then it's a kind of problem um and yeah. you have to ask yourself is this useful is this is this still alive this feeling or is it just an old residue yeah or is there some yeah. can we bypass it with 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 something else yeah with comedy <laughs> yeah a lot of the time a lot of the time yeah and it's not blaming and i meant to say this before you know there's no and the whole point of this is not we're not blaming anyone it's not anybody's fault um but so often it's the the children of the people who who have these illnesses or who are not well who bear a lot of the burden or you know are are not not part of the conversation yeah and yeah. the the impact it has on them which is why we're doing this it's not to to point any fingers at at anybody else or at the parents you know everybody's doing the best they can and coping the best they can i think it's just really important to hear from voices like yours more often yeah so yeah. i really appreciate you coming here and and being so open and so honest it's just been a real pleasure just to hear your story and yeah i'm just really grateful so thank you so much thanks pam i've really enjoyed talking to you and now there's a dog outside can you hear it <laughs> no this has been my family mental illness and me thank you so much for listening don't forget we would love you to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts so you automatically get new episodes Please share these stories with anyone you think might need to hear them. You can help bring talking about mental illness out of the shadows. If you're experiencing any of the issues discussed in this podcast, please know that you can get in touch with the charity Our Time. Our Time provides support to thousands of children and young people who have parents or guardians dealing with mental illness. It's ourtime.org. Dot UK, or at Our Time Charity on social media. If you feel like you're struggling with mental health or you've been affected by anything in this episode, it's really important that you speak to someone. There are links to help in the show notes, but you can also contact your GP, call the Samaritans on 116 123 or contact Childline on 0800 1111. My Family, Mental Illness and Me is made for our time by Spoken Media. The production team are Patrick Wallace and Dave Howard. Original music composed by Joel Cox. <laughs> <laughs>